Will everyone in the audience hold on firmly to their seat, please? What unearthly horror did that girl gaze upon? What manner of incredible thing walked beneath that hood? So fantastic. Words can't begin to describe it. You must see it with your own eyes to believe it. When the fly comes your way. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sitting in the Dark. I'm Pete Wright. And before we get started, this is a show about horror movies, and we talk about a whole bunch of them today. If you've never seen any of the movies of The Fly, you should probably go do that if you don't want to be spoiled at all on them, because we spoil all of them. That'd be The Fly, 1958, Return of the Fly, 1959, The Curse of the Fly, 1965, The Fly, 1986, and The Fly 2, 1989. Go do your homework. Come back, and let's do a show. Hi, welcome to Sitting in the Dark. This is the podcast where we here at the Next Reel come together and discuss all things horror. My name is Ray Delancey, and joining me are Tommy Handsome. Hey, fly time. And the inimitable Pete Wright. I'm like a fly. I'm mm-hmm. going to fly away. Mm-hmm. Am I the first one to think of that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally watched Superfly, so I'm going to oh, have a real tough time. Very, very different movie. Yeah. We're going to be talking today about The Fly, the first movie of which came out in 1958. And, uh, Probably the one most people are familiar with is the one that came out in 86 with Jeff Goldblum, and each one had its sequels. So uh, we're going to go through those and talk about them and how they hold up before we got into watching these for this episode. Uh, Had you guys been familiar with the movies? I had just seen, I had only seen the Goldblum one way back when it well, I guess not when it came out, because I would have been too young. But at some point, I saw the Jeff Goldblum. That's really the only one that I'd seen. Uh, and I had famously <clears throat> not seen the original one. And I was very surprised, and I know we're not going into it big, that it was in color. Right. Because I just always assumed it was in black and white. And apparently, that might be because just everyone had black and white television sets. Uh, yeah. But you the know, whole thing was, that's yeah. actually... That's kind of like a Mandela effect thing where a lot of people swear that that first movie was in black and white, but actually it's only the two sequels that were in black and white. And like you said, of course, a lot of people certainly saw it on their TVs, which, you know, until the the 80s were a lot of which were black and white. Yeah. Um, so that was fun. Didn't mean to cut you off there. No. Uh, were you a fan of it? Uh, I of the Goldblum one. I think so. I don't remember it being so gnarly. <laughs> I think I had a, <laughs> a stronger stomach or something, or maybe yeah. I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, I remember liking it and thinking that Jeff Goldblum was really weird and really interesting in it. That was the trick. I mean, it was for me. It was Goldblum, but I grew up with a mother who was fascinated by the fly, loved it, loved it, loved it. And whenever she needed, as I was a kid, whenever she needed help from me, like in the kitchen or something like that, she (laughs) would scream, help me, Peter, help me. And and it was, that's like how I grew up. She was just fascinated by trolling me with that voice, even though I hadn't seen the movie until, I don't know, I was probably in college or something. And then I didn't think much of it. um, and, And so I had really flimsy memories of the movie uh, until we watched it for this round. And this round, I did the whole thing. So uh, also, Andy and I had done the Goldblum uh, when we were doing our Cronenberg series. Mm-hmm. So I, right. I had some uh, little bit more recent memory, but I hadn't seen the Stoltz. I didn't even know that I had seen the Stoltz version until I uh, watched it last night. And I was like, this is very, very familiar to me. Uh, clearly, okay. I have seen this before, but did not know it. So, um, yeah, that's I, I what I'm curious about is how this how the fly ranks in your canon of classic movie monsters right mm-hmm. like this is like this you mentioned the fly in the yeah. course of our discussion about frankenstein and dracula and all of those things so how does how does the fly rank for you well uh it, it's one that i kind of grew up on because when i was a kid uh my grandmother would show me a lot of the older 
uh, horror movies that had been on TV and stuff. Like, um, and I was very familiar with Vincent Price. And so this one, it, it's hard to gauge because there's a lot of nostalgia there, but mm-hmm. it's definitely really high up for me because I think this is just a terrific horror movie that really encapsulates the era well. And it's, uh, I think it holds up mostly. And I, 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 I can't give you like a list ranking or anything like that, but it's really high. But, but in your head, like that's the most important thing. Like in your head, when you think of classic movie monsters, the fly is there. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's awesome. Because this, this is, this is one of those movies that is iconic. You know, when I think of the fly, I immediately think of that shot whenever she pulls the veil off of his head and reveals Mm -hmm. the monster for the first time. And then you get that great shot with the kaleidoscopic lens of like 50 pictures of her screaming. You know, it's it's just so cool. So cool. Yeah, for sure. So let's go ahead and get into this then. Um, So the first one obviously was the 1958 film, which, uh, was based on a short story written for Playboy magazine. Oh, as you do. As you do. Actually, it was crazy. Like I'm going I might sound like really green when I say this, but I did not realize that back then Playboy was the place to have your short story published. Mm. Like so many guys like uh yeah. norman mailer for one and i forget who oh, else yeah. but so many guys had their stories published in playboy and that's where they were discovered before they yeah. like started writing actual books and stuff that trope you read playboy for the articles isn't a trope yeah. for nothing right, right. <laughs> like that's, that's legit like a lot of people do also read it for the articles and and uh i think it had a a great reputation as a as a publishing destination for a lot of people. One of the documentaries that I watched uh, about the Fly movies, they interviewed um, Hef, Hugh Hefner, mm-hmm. about whenever they the Fly got submitted, uh, it, written by George Langolin, by the mm-hmm. way, who I don't know any of his other works, but uh, that's the author. So he writes the fly and <laughs> I think it would be better if the fly was in penthouse forum. <laughs> I never thought this would happen to me. I never thought I'd be writing this. I letter. never thought I'd be writing this. I was sitting down uh, drinking milk laced with rum and all of a sudden <laughs> as an avid reader, I've always wondered if the stories are true. It is. It is actually funny just not to belabor the playboy thing, but I was just searching for like the, the list because there's, they keep this large kind of anthology list of people whose work has been significantly published or discovered in Playboy magazine. It includes yeah. Joyce Carol o- Oates, Philip K. Dick, Norman Mailer, Stephen King, Frank Herbert, Roald Dahl, wow. uh, John Whoa. Irving, John Irving, Arthur C. Clarke, P.G. Wodehouse, John Cheever, John Updike, Doris, Doris Lessing, Nadine Gordimer, Shirley Jackson, James Baldwin. I'm saving the big dog for last, everybody. In Playboy magazine, Vladimir Nabokov. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's the punchline to his own joke. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. Uh, Playboy magazine. Uh, so it, it was a short story. It was extremely popular. And right away, some folks over at 20th Century Fox snatched up the rights and started to get this movie made. And they kind of went all out. They gave it a decent budget. They decided to film it in CinemaScope, which was the wide anamorphic aspect (laughs) ratio. And uh, they filmed it in color, as we mentioned before. And they got Vincent Price to star in it, which is, it's interesting that they have Vincent Price, uh, starring in it but he's not right the main actor in the movie as a matter of fact yeah. his screen time is pretty limited when you think about it uh the main characters are unknowns really al hedison who actually soon after this became david hedison was an unknown at the time having only one role before this 
And Patricia Owens was thought of by many of the people on the set as basically the discount Lucille Ball. Ouch. <laughs> Ow. Although I can totally see it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and they did get Herbert Marshall, who was uh, an actor of great renown at the time, to play Inspector Shiraz. So they took this story and they actually made it pretty faithfully to the story. Uh, they only changed two things. Uh, one was the ending. Uh, they originally in the story had Helene committing suicide. And after she divulges the truth about what happened to Andre. And then there's also, and this should interest you, Tommy. Uh, they also had a sequence in the story where um, she is begging him to go through the machine one more time, thinking, you know, maybe you'll come out okay if you just go through it one more time, which he does in the movie. But this time, whenever he comes out the other side, he's not only still the fly, but now he's got some of the cat's genetic material <sighs> uh, included as well. She describes the fact that he comes through and now he's got like this white hair and the pointed ears and the wet pink nose. But then he has those huge saucer like yeah. eyes of the fly and Oof. got that uh, crazy looking mouth and it just uh, a, a lot of there's a lot of what we would go on to see in Cronenberg's version I mean we didn't see the cat but like the, the body horror element mm -hmm. was in the story like totally but you didn't see as much of the body horror uh, as you would see in Cronenberg's in the original version, because it was thought that the audiences wouldn't be able to handle it. Mm. So anyway, uh, they made the movie and it went on to make 3 million bucks, which was, wow. They, that was astounding to them mm -hmm. that it would make so much money. Now you guys both having watched it now, what what were your thoughts on this? It always takes me a little while to shift into, oh, right, we didn't really know how to talk back then. <laughs> like older <laughs> movies, it's just uh, one of the things, the first thing that I thought was really interesting is it's told largely in flashback. And I was wondering, right, what, yeah. the, what do we think the point of that was other than that's a way to end with like a big shock ending? Because it, you're sort of telling it in a way that you can end with the big reveal. Um, but, you know, because Cronenberg's is done in sequential or, or chronological right. order. Why do you guys think that that was that just more of a trope back then? Well, I don't know if it was more of a trope. This is just my thought. But uh, another big thing is the, the shocking beginning, if you will. Whenever the caretaker is in the factory and he sees the bloody right. mess on the hydraulic press, because uh, apart from Hammer, which really had only started releasing big gory horror movies, I think that same year with Curse of Frankenstein and Dracula, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of blood and gore in horror movies of that era. So to see that guy's shocked reaction and then cut to the hydraulic press where we see all that bright red blood flowing yeah. over yeah. the sides uh, was a big deal, I would think. So that, that's, uh, that, that's my thought. Uh, Pete. Yeah. I think that's the, that's like the insistence of using color, right? That that's where right. color makes a difference because really that popped. would be just like oil on the floor. <laughs> <and black Right. laughs> it's like, <laughs> no intensity at all. I, you know, I think it's really interesting contextually, like when you look at this movie and the time that it came out, again, since a lot of horror movies around this era were um, kind of our nightmare manifestations of what could happen when technology goes awry. Mm -hmm. um, right. yeah, yeah. You know, this movie as something where, oh my gosh, look at the, like, we're applying some sort of light-based radiation to these things and causing mutation to them. Even the plate early on 
was, um, you know, when the, it had the letters all screwy when it would, the yeah. plate was fine, apparently, but the, the print on the bottom was somehow uh, affected, which I thought was really interesting. It, it, they really were sort of designing the first chat GPT, like just stuff. It's like when the device starts hallucinating and you end up with this mm -hmm. weird, uh, weird model of language getting twisted around. And then you, you have the the devastation that comes when the fly gets in the case. And it's a it's such a trope now to use this sort of DNA mutilation as a source of horror. And yeah. we see it all the time. I mean, for crying out loud, this might as well be Spider-Man, right? Like a, <laughs> a, a nod mm. and a wink in another direction and the fly is a superhero. Um, and And so I think it's really interesting the way this movie manifests fear but also grief, like so much. But when you talk about why we we see it in a flashback, because we set up early on just how devastated she is and we don't know why. Right. Like that becomes the emotional mystery of the whole thing mm. that we don't know what it was until the end when the inspector mm. has the rock over his head. And you realize he's about to crush, you know, her the love of her life, who's now embodied in a fly and is being eaten, actively eaten by a spider. Like that is a horrifying image, probably more horrifying in 1958 and even more horrifying in the book or the story, which I have I have not read uh, just because the imagination is so gruesome on that line. Like I even just said it and both of you kind of recoil. I know. <laughs> and, and when we watch it on screen, it's it is that but it's less so because help me help me. It, it's a little bit candy color candy colored right now. But um, but it's a it is that suddenly is the punchline to her story of grief. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important kind of construction of the film. And that's to me, that's why it's told in flashback, because we need to know she's so sad, that's horrible smart. things happen. And now we get to see why she's so sad. Right. To start with that and then to go backwards. Yeah. That's cool. And yeah. to go back to your first part about the chat GPT, about the uh, just because we can doesn't mean we should advancement. Mm -hmm. This film also really a lot of times that's the uh, sort of subtext of these kind yeah. of things of Godzilla. We're worried about this. And they, they come out. She really just comes out and says it. She says, Andre, mm -hmm. I get so scared sometimes. The suddenness of our age, electronics, rockets earth satellite supersonic flight and now this i don't know what earth satellites are but uh the the idea that she's saying we're moving too fast and we don't mm -hmm. know what we're doing he clearly does not know what he's doing uh yeah. he's just like he, he's doing things in pencil <laughs> that was my favorite <laughs> he, has, he has this huge room filled with flashing lights and he's like oh click, 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 give me a pencil has, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. because it's really about we're moving so fast, we're not thinking, should we do it? And we don't know why it's happening. Uh, yeah, isn't it ironic that it would be a Jeff Goldblum line some, you know, 15 years later, just because we can do a thing just doesn't doesn't mean that we should. Right, exactly. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I, I so that's what's interesting. And the other to that point, and I, I, I'm interested in, in your thoughts, Ray, on this as a mm -hmm. monster movie, when to Tom's point, so much of this is a technology movie, so much more is a technology movie, even yeah. more so in the sequel and the se threequel after that. Like, right. this is not a movie. It, the, I, my feeling was they, they wanted to uh, have the, a fly sequel and needed to make a fly in it. And so they found a way to shoehorn one in. But really, the story was about the business of of the electronics and the the you know intrigue that goes on when there are competing ideas and frankly it's also an intellectual property story or a technological property story like yeah, selling totally. papers to the mob and like there's so much more to it that isn't has nothing to do with this monster movie that we're ostensibly mm. there to watch do you right. i mean what's what's your take on that you know it, it i am fascinated by the science fiction aspect of this mm -hmm. movie the invention of the disintegrator reintegrator machine uh you know it i can't watch this movie first of all without thinking of star trek and the transporter on the yeah. enterprise you know because uh, and i wonder it, I, I didn't find an answer to this but i always wonder if this might have been an inspiration for that but uh thinking about what the 
what the 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 culture was like at the time in the 1950s you know you've had world war ii the a bomb so you know what scientists are capable of uh, mm. coming up with these destructive things uh, they made them scary thinking about uh, the military industrial complex uh, one kind of throwaway line in this that uh, in i think vincent price mentions to Shiraz that Andre was working for the Canadian Air Ministry. And yeah. this is mm. only mentioned once. It's not really made a point in the plot, but it, it, I think it's interesting that that kind of hark that kind of is developed later in the 86 film whenever we find out that Goldblum's been uh, financed completely by this company called Bart Bartok or Bartek mm -hmm. Bartok. Bartok, but yeah. and we'll get, and we'll get to that. But uh, it, there is a lot there, and I, I love that the science fiction element here feels within the realm of possibility to a point. I mean, it's, it looks ridiculous and it seems ridiculous, but he's kind of right. Like, what is what would the next big transportation? Uh, leap b yeah like a revolution and, yeah yeah and it works for me and and i really like the melding of science fiction and horror here in science fiction and horror make such good bedfellows and, yeah. and, and in in a lot of ways this is very new but in a lot of ways it's also very old because we're fair, we're familiar with the mad scientist trope mm-hmm we're familiar yeah, with, from, yeah. ironically, from Frankenstein. <laughs> right. And and a lot of that machinery from the fly looks very similar to something mm -hmm. you'd see in Frankenstein. Because this is so much of a science fiction story and less so a, uh, you know, a monster movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder what it is that is that is frightening for you guys about watching this movie like if you were and i know it's not a scary movie so to speak but what do you find the frightening part i have like, my thing which i think is the scariest part of the 1958 or the 1986 movie the jeff goldblum movie and it's in the 1958 one it's the idea both movies have to do with um a lot of suffering, grossness, body horror, things like that, and then an ending. Something, someone suffers and then they end, mm -hmm. except for one character, and that's Dandilo, Dandilo, whatever his name is, the cat. The cat yeah. that mm -hmm. just disappears, uh, that he doesn't know what it is because he forgot to sharpen his pencil, and he just sends the cat into Adam World, and later he's like, she's like, where is the cat? And he goes, I don't know, just a bunch of cat uh, atoms yeah. floating around. But you hear it meowing from nowhere <laughs> that's really i mean it's not scary but that is the most shaking for me that's the most horror versus terror of it yeah. because that cat's just going to be whatever the idea of being conscious of having like sentience and consciousness but not having any physical ability or agency is really the scariest thing for me yeah. because there's no end to it uh, it reminds me a lot um this whole thing reminded me a lot of king Sh uh, stephen king's short story the jaunt which is sort of mm -hmm. his version of the fly there's nothing gets um mixed in dna doesn't get mixed in but it's about the idea of coming up with teleportation and the horrors that can be a part of that um and there's this really it, it doesn't matter either way so that's dandelo the cat was the part that i can't stop thinking about because everything else sort of had an yeah. ending the thing that gets that I always focus on is how far humankind is willing to go to make stuff like this happen mm -hmm. to how far a person is willing to go to finish their project or to be proved right in something. And to the point where they will risk an animal or sometimes uh, another person or even themselves, as we see here. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in both this and the 86 movie, there's no reason why he shouldn't have tested more before putting himself through or been more thorough before putting himself through it. And especially yeah. in the 86 one, in the 86 one, it was really, he was drunk and on a whim, he put himself through. 
Right. And that's like the whole story of hubris of both of these characters in the in the fly movies. The first mm-hmm. one is like this is the horror for that uh, for for those movies for me is is rooted deeply in that human greed, the human just sort of sense of entitlement for what we were talking about earlier. We we can do this thing, so we should just do it and and break stuff and figure out, right. you know, the implications later. I think that's really scary. And that's so much of what this movie leans on. But interestingly, the arc of both of these series uh, do, inverts that horror on the other end, right? It starts with what the scientists are willing to do to themselves. But mm-hmm. as soon as it gets out, it's what all of the businesses are willing to do to the scientists, right? Like, right, on, yeah. in, it, particularly, I mean, then that's the Stoltz story for sure, which is, you know, and Eric Stoltz, um, he has Brundle's, what's it called, right? Brundle's Acceleration disease or something oh, the where, accelerate yeah I, I forget yeah. exactly what the term is but he, he has accelerated growth yeah horrible birth scene in the beginning where there is some sort of larva born and then also a baby and the baby it be, grows up very quickly over five years to become eric stoltz which actually i think probably is how eric stoltz grew up too <laughs> um and he beca- is trapped in this bar talk uh, I- industries. I'm saying all this because I have a feeling people listening probably didn't watch <laughs> the fly too, but maybe they should. So he's trapped in this corporate compound and he ends up, they running experiments on him and it's because he has this genetic like predisposition to change into a giant man fly. And he does. And then we get into some serious creature effects. Like this is a, uh, this ends up being a, a, a deeply creature focused movie, but it's the creature for whom we have deep sympathy against the corporate industrial complex that's trying to study him. And and that is sort of the inversion because he doesn't want to do any of this to himself. He mm-hmm. he's kind of you get the feeling that he's on board for the uh, betterment of mankind bit and making the transporters work in dad's footsteps, which is harkens back to the sequels of The Fly. But he is very much uh, a victim and as such turns to violence once he's a creature to save himself. And then ultimately, yeah. And that's something that I love about the the two 80s movies is, yeah. you know, you definitely have you definitely know where the sci fi uh, angle was coming from in the fifties, like I said, with, you know, the fear of scientists and all that. But in the eighties, you know, you had the Reagan era, you had the conservatism, uh, that came along with that. And you ha- also had the AIDS epidemic. Mm-hmm. And so uh, instead of someone just instantly turning into a monster, you have these characters, Goldblum in the first Stoltz in the second, you have this character who is slowly and painfully morphing and changing into this uh ugly and deformed looking monster and well that's interesting though ray that perspective is interesting do you think it's painful for them i never got the sense that it was a painful thing like goldblum's teeth are falling out and it doesn't feel like it hurts him maybe not painful for them but painful Painful for for us us. yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, and, and definitely you have the, like, like you mentioned several times now, the corporation taking over mm-hmm. it, and that being a thing. Yeah. The AIDS, epi- the AIDS epidemic is interesting. I hadn't made that connection because I thought that while 1958 was about new, fast developing technology, I thought 86 nukes. Yeah. nukes yeah. That uh, yeah. 86 could be just about the horrors of aging. I mean, Gina sure. Davis is watching her beloved grow alien to her as things start failing. I mean, he goes through this burst. It's almost like a whole life cycle. He goes through a birth of like mm-hmm. he's at the height of his powers and he can do everything. And then it just everything starts being sort of taken away from him, including his mind by the end of it. Yes. Uh, and so yeah. that plus AIDS uh, is that makes sense of why Cronenberg would maybe want to dig into this, especially with mm-hmm. his pre predilection for body horror and stuff, that that's a way yeah. of really exploring those kind of themes. Did it hold up for you, Tom? Um, yes, but I don't want to see it again. <laughs> it's too, <laughs> it's just too gross. I mean, I, yeah. I'm for, I love horror. I don't love gore and especially body horror. 
And so that's what has kept me from certain Cronenberg movies. Um, and so, yeah, just to sort of see someone be more and more in pain and scary. And I hate anything involving animals. Um, yeah. Well, the so, second one then, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Rough. Yeah. This the second one. Let's 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 talk about these eighties movies. Yeah, you want to jump through those? Yeah. So uh this first of all, if you if you're listening to this and you haven't seen The Fly 2 and you want a reason, the final draft was written by Frank Darabont. So, wow. Yes, which is really interesting. Be, and that he was chosen because he had just uh done the remake of the blob which was successful oh wow mm-hmm. but right. the fly too i think was a really solid sequel to uh, a really good movie that cronenberg did in 86 but the, the fly too has a whole sequence where they have this golden retriever and what? the golden that's the right golden retriever yeah, is an, is a lab animal he's kept in a cage in a lab And Eric Stoltz befriends this dog as a child, and he sees this dog put into the disintegrator. And whenever the dog comes out, he's still alive, but he's this deformed animal who's in a lot of pain. And he's, like, ripping everyone that comes near him to shreds. And Eric Stoltz grows up, and he he finds that they've kept this dog, like, deep in the bowels of... Uh, the building in this pit that's like wet and grimy and just disgusting looking and they keep it's it like a dungeon it. it's like a yeah. dungeon like it is really a it's a horrible place and the aesthetic is mm-hmm. quite different from the rest of this l- building that we see bar talk industries uh, because everything's you know it's high-tech lab it's clean it's you know, mm-hmm. up to date and all that. And then you see this grimy dungeon like room where they keep this dog. And uh, Eric Stoltz is so upset that they have this dog that he puts the dog out of its misery. It's just a really sad, sad story. And then in the end, spoiler alert, you see Bartok, the guy who runs the company, get his comeuppance because he suffers the same fate as the dog and they keep him in the dungeon. Yeah. But yeah. And that dungeon too, like that whole, that the, the whole architecture of Bartok Industries is such an, a, a perfect metaphor for like poison roots, right? Like this whole thing is clean and beautiful, but deep at its core, mm. all the way deep below the basement is this rotten place where they keep these like horrible uh, creation, suffering creations that they've made and choose not to do anything with they keep them around to study and poke and prod and do bad things like morally questionable things to these creatures and uh and so i i really do i mean that that feels like such a uh, such a nice thing on a movie that was largely ignored like it it actually has uh it has something to it it Mm. has something there yeah Definitely. Uh, now, how does uh, going back real quick to the the eighty six movie? We got Tommy's take. Uh, what was your take on it, Pete? Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm I I think this defines why I didn't watch a lot of Cronenberg for a lot of years because of the very reasons. Like I I just was really turned off by a lot of the body horror stuff that Goldblum goes through and the fingernails and the teeth and and all of those things that start falling off, and then especially when he vomits onto his. <laughs> food to regurgitate it is a it's a yeah. horrible thing and uh to watch i have i've since come around to a lot more cronenberg because andy made me and um so we've we've done more body horror stuff with cronenberg i think i'm a little bit desensitized to it but um but it still is is you know it's peak dis- disintegration mm-hmm. right like it is <laughs> for of all of the movies like this is the one that i think most in my head accurately describes the nightmare that I would imagine if you just told me this had happened, right? Yeah. Like this is what I see on screen is my nightmare scape of this story. Had I only been told it, you know what I mean? That's a, that's a pretty special feat to be able to, <laughs> to create the kind of awful language that I can create in my own head. Yeah. Uh, so the horror in this series, because we talked a lot about the sci-fi 
does mm-hmm. the horror work for you in this and the old one? I, the the monster itself. What do you think of the monster in these movies? Tom, you love the giant fly head, right? That's totally relatable. To <laughs> in the nineteen fifty eight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the monster in the first one is. <laughs> kind of silly but is also still effective like when the first time it's what's really effective for me is when it has the hood on mm-hmm. when that, they I'm, jaws it yeah when the, and when the hood comes off that's when it's no longer that effective for me although i can sort of think i mean because it was very well done for back mm-hmm. then it looked and there was some moving parts and stuff and the um and so uh but the hood was always much scarier and just sort of seeing him like knock for once for yes and twice for no mm-hmm. and all of that not being able to speak that was really worked for me the monster in the 1986 one of course is very horrible and disgusting and um it's interesting what they when in the final one once it has actually he has become a cronenberg fever dream where he's part technology part fly part human all of those things that you still really kind of feel bad for him because it gives mm-hmm. they give you those disney eyes they're like really big eyes yeah. and it's like crawling over to it and that was i was surprised to feel so sad at the yeah. end and it really just mm-hmm. leaves you there there's no real coda she's sitting there right. with stumpy magoo and her now dead <laughs> lover and she's crying and then it goes the fly was designed by steve and i was like geez right. Louise, <laughs> hard out boy oh boy there's no like like she's wrapped you know like she's drinking coffee out of a cardboard cup and has like yeah like it's, it just leaves you there which was rough the, that's actually a really interesting point too especially in the context of fly and fly two because mm-hmm. the end of the fly two the whole point of Bartok going through the the uh, teleporter is that he goes through with Stoltz and there is this program running to in the course of teleportation to take the bad chromosomes out of the fly and mm-hmm. replace them with the good chromosomes from the other body that's in there, in this case, Bartok. And we already the setup was very early on, the setup was that the the one who gets the replacement chromosomes gonna be fine. The other one is going to be quote non viable, and right. so we already know what's going to happen when that happens. But when he comes out, comes out and we see Bartok, the mutated mass of genes coming out, and then dr- trailing like a dingleberry behind him is this sack of Eric Stoltz, who is when he comes out of the sack fine. That blew me away that they left the fly too with a happy ending, Mm, a happy ending to this movie. I was I I'm trying to figure out what is it about that movie? What is it about that intention that somehow didn't sit well with me? I I felt like the story that they set up all along was that this is going to end badly for everybody. And maybe I was just conditioned by all the other fly movies that there's no way this is going to technology has to fail. But in this case, technology worked. That's the end is like optimistic. It did what it said it was going to do. We have wrought this thing and we have benefited from it. You really would have loved the original ending to that movie, which just kind of saw Daphne Zuniga and Eric Stoltz sitting on the dock, looking off into the sunset, hugging each other, happy that they're living together now. And then he vomits on her. Tell me he vomits on her. (laughs) No. Was that not in the draft? (laughs) No, it wasn't. Somebody thought of that. (laughs) <laughs> I would not have liked that ending. I don't think I would have been on board with that ending. Uh, but do you, I mean, I, seriously, you, as you're watching these things, like, and, and you having watched the second one and been more favorable on it, I gather, than the yeah. first time you watched it. I'll be, the first time I saw The Fly 2, that ending shocked the hell out of me. Because yeah. I just, it was like right out of left field. I totally yeah. didn't see it coming. But it 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 works for me. And I think part of the reason it works for me is because the dog died and the very last scene is you see the bad guy get his comeuppance for that. Right. They put Bartok in the dungeon. Yeah. Right. And Bartok is the last one you see. So you don't think too much about uh, Brundle and you don't about him being all right Mm -hmm. in that. Uh, Mm -hmm. At least I didn't. So uh, it, 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 it. I don't really, I guess it's okay for me. 
I, I don't have any strong feelings. It just feels like this is a story about like about the uh, about human technological failure. And as I'm saying that, I'm thinking about okay, like okay, uh, the Godzilla movies, right? We yeah. haven't talked about Godzilla and Sitting in the Dark at all yet, but as in terms of classic monsters, I'm sure that's on a list somewhere. Um, and largely, things are okay after entire cities have been <laughs> ripped to, to <laughs> right. rubble. Um, right. Not not great, but. Uh, but in terms of these kinds of stories where we're dealing with the intimacy of character level stuff, I just this this surprised me. I'm I'm with you, uh, Ray. It felt out of left field. Huh. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point. I can't uh, think of any. I mean, they're good Canadian movies is what we're saying. I mean, they take place up in <laughs> Canada. And maybe that's something to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I, it's exactly it. They're trying to be nice. Yeah. For The Fly, too, the pacing is kind of weird because the first half of the movie is really slow. You know, you, you, it really focuses a lot of time on Eric Stoltz and his work on the telepods. But then uh, as soon as he starts to show the symptoms of becoming The Fly, all of a sudden it gets kicked into high gear and it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on. They do make scientists bad because at that at that point in the movie, the scientists that are supposedly his support team are really rude. I guess the that woman is rude all the time. Like she's never been really a right. nice person, but everybody is becomes really kind of hateful to to him. Really isolates him even more. Right. They they see him as an experiment and not a person. They mm -hmm. they are excited at what studying him could lead to they they couldn't care less about him as a person and that that tracks because we see all the different animals that these people keep in cages and stuff they are used to not having feelings toward these things as we might toward an, uh, pets and things but they think of them as lab rats essentially yeah. and they're thinking of him as just another lab rat all I'm I'm curious your take on the women in these movies, right? There's always a woman in the movie. Mm -hmm. In the first one, it's Helene, right? It's the the mm -hmm. wife. It's the it's the it's, there's always someone, and you know we've got um uh you just mentioned Daphne Zuniga in The Fly too. We've got what was her name in The Fly? Why can't I think of it? Gina Davis. Uh, Ronnie. Gina Davis. You have Gina Davis, Ronnie in The Fly. All of the movies have this sort of woman character. What's your take on how they transition with regard to story in these movies? In the first Fly movies, you know, they treat the woman as, you know, well, uh, you can't know much about my experiment. I'm not going to explain it because you couldn't possibly understand it. And that's in all of them. You know, Curse of the Fly, mm -hmm. Return of the Fly, you know, they, they keep the women in the dark. Uh, and they are, are only there to deal with the aftermath. Mm -hmm. And in the 80s movies, uh, they they don't have as much of a hands-on role as the scientist, but they are there and they are involved. They know what's going on. Uh, Gina Davis is documenting everything. She's encouraging him to continue, and she's genuinely trying to help him whenever the bad thing happens. Uh, and, and you get pretty much the same thing with Daphne Zuniga in The Fly too, where she comes yeah. along and she's helping him with the experiment as much as she can. And she's also the one trying to help him all the way up to the end. The Gina Davis one, the one thing that we talked about him, the hubris of putting himself through the transporter when he did, when he was drunk. But very importantly, he wasn't just drunk. He was also very upset about her going to see her former lover. And so yeah. that put him sort of in a tailspin of I'm out of control of this. So how do I get back in control or can I do something to impress the girl? in effect, right. or get my mind off the girl, she sort of becomes an unwitting fo uh, foil in that way. Okay. That's right. The impetus for all of this science and everything comes from something deeply normal and human. Jealousy. Well, that he just wants jealousy. And yeah, the, the uncomfortability of that, he can't sit with that. And so he's talking to the monkey and then he becomes a fly man. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's what love yeah, does totally. to you, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's really interesting. And in comparison to the 58 movie, right, in particular, where it's the, the, the foil is just the thing to scream, uh, in, in both of the, the 80s fly movies, we get the female characters with agency in their own domain, whatever that is, right? Ronnie is, uh, you, you know, she's she is a writer and a reporter and she has agency there in a way that Goldblum does not. Um, and so they both bring something to the table that I think is is compelling. And I think that's what makes her character so interesting is that, you know, it's wrapped up and it's not it's not petty. Right. It, it's actually it actually has resonance when when you watch that their relationship, I think, is deeper because of it, because it allows us to have this experience of his jealousy because she's going to see Stumpy. And that that matters, right? That 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 matters to the movie. And I think the same thing with Daphne Zuniga, that she's a she's already like she's some sort of computer scientist, like she's working nights right. in the filing system because she's new. Uh, but she obviously has her own agency with this brand new technology and is able to truck with it and and be a support system um, in, totally. in that way, which I think is I think that makes these characters actually more interesting to watch. So, yeah. yeah. I totally agree. All of that said, we didn't go too much into the sequels to the original Fly, and mm -hmm. which is fine because honestly, they're not that great. <laughs> I'll see, there you go, dropping it again. The second one, I'll just say because I you made me watch them. I'm gonna just say it out loud. The second one um, had some interesting things going on there. All of them are tales of the continuation of research by the family, the Delambre family. Um, generationally they go i think they go down and then down and sideways right like uncles right. and cousins i don't know it's a whole family business so the second one is interesting because they introduce more corporate intrigue of the time and and a criminal element uh right. where they they have a guy who embedded himself he's he's a con artist and he's trying to steal secrets so i thought that was an interesting thing to add the third one is the Island of Dr. Moreau version of it, where you have these um, all of the mistakes that they make in the process of building the technology. They store in in these giant like closet cages down in the in the basement. And those closet closet cages are are maintained by some racially questionable choices <laughs> for Chinese people. Um, yeah. It's not great. It's really not great. Um, but they're there. And. Uh, there is intrigue around it. There is mental health intrigue there. I mean, there's so much crammed into this movie that they don't they don't ever really finish any one of the threads that they un start unspooling. But I think it has some interesting things to, to do with it. And I think it's a largely kind of underwritten, underwritten, uh, under appreciated uh, film because it's a third in a B movie monster right. series but it actually mm -hmm. has it's actually saying something and i think that's i i think that was that was fun it's also not about the fly i mean there are all kinds of mixed creatures in in that one like it's you know yeah bunnies and cats and people who are just crossed with a trash bag i don't know they're smooth <laughs> and then there was the, and then at the end a guy melts i don't understand why that happens like it's just very there's some very confusing things but in the course of the confusion is some substance one thing i i just remembered with return of the fly there's this one storyline in return of the fly where philippe delam's lab assistant turns out to be this crook who's working for yeah. the mob and he's going to steal the secrets of the disintegrator reintegrator and they're going to sell it to the highest bidder and the one th that really stuck out to me this time because we already have the 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 corporate intrigue if you will with the military industrial complex type thing but what's interesting is it was revealed uh a few years back in real life <laughs> that back in the 60s the CIA was actually working with the mob to try to take down Fidel Castro right. and things like mm -hmm. that. So I think it's, I find this storyline in this movie interesting because it is not as far out of the realm of possibility as it once seemed to be. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, yeah. And it pushes us to like, 
to consider, like we already, the movie is already telling us to be terrified of the technology we don't understand. But it's also telling us not to trust a whole lot of other things that um, the movie maybe has no business telling us not to trust. Like it's right. really, it's really trying to do, uh, trying to punch above its class. Hmm. Totally. Totally. Where did you watch them? Just for people who are interested in watching them, where did you, do you, you own them all? You have the collection. I own you them, yeah. Uh, Shout, Shout Factory put out this great box set with uh, all five of the movies. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, really great. It has a great treasure trove of bonus features on there. And they all look spectacular. Um, I can look and see where they're I believe... Mats. They were all, all of them, mats. except for the curse of the right. fly. That one is on YouTube. I watched <laughs> okay, the whole yeah. thing on YouTube and it was great. But everything else was on Max. Yeah. Curse of the fly didn't. It's crazy. It never got a home video release until 2004. Whenever it was wow. put on DVD in yeah. a, one of those combined sets with yeah. uh, the first two movies. So that's interesting. It's too uh, bad. It, yeah. It, it, and it didn't do badly when it came out. So I don't mm -hmm. know why it never got a home video release. Well, that's actually a question we didn't talk about. How well were these received collectively? All of them did well. That, yeah. There wasn't a single one that was a dud financially. Fascinating. So much for the, the, the also ran fly monster. Isn't so also ran y'all go watch some fly. <laughs> it's fun. Um, uh, so uh, Ray, awesome! Thank you. I'm Thank so glad you, you you picked the fly. I don't think we. I think it would have taken us a while to get back to the fly had you not uh, asserted your uh, your desires early. Uh, and I'm really glad we did because I had a ball with these movies, every one of them. I'm glad. Uh, Very yeah. glad. So technically, in the rotation, would be Tom <laughs> next. Now, Tom, do you have an idea of what you want to talk about next? Like, I'm if it were you, brimming with ideas. But you don't want to plug nope. anything. You don't share. No, no spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. Okay. Uh, I think we're working on a guest teacher, a pair of guest teachers for next month. I don't want to commit to names, mm. but I will say I believe we're going to have guest teachers join us to talk about demonic possession movies. We'll see mm, nice. if scheduling works out accordingly, but I'm very excited to build the curriculum. As always, you can find the lists. Uh, uh, the lists for Sitting in the Dark are, are collected at uh, on our, the, lex, the next reel. The next reel's uh, a letterboxed page, letterboxd.com slash the next reel, and you can uh, clone the list to your own collection so you can watch along with us. As soon as I have the demonic possession list, I will post it on Letterboxd so you can get to a watching. Um, though I'm sure, Tom, you've probably seen every demonic possession movie out there, right? Seen a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of your jam, too. This is going to be fun. Yep. Uh, I'm not as into it. Ray, are you into the demon possession movies? I, I, I've seen a fair few, but I'm not into that subgenre as much as others. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be, I'm, I think I'm going to learn probably the most of the three of us. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've seen the big ones and yeah. stayed away from a lot of the others. So excited to do this with them and excited to have done this with both of you, Ray. Thank you so much for your education. Uh, oh, thank today. you. So much fun. And Tom, always, <laughs> always, your contributions are masterful and you are as handsome as ever. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us. Uh, we will be back next month. You can find us sitting in the dark.